Thank you for taking the time today to spend with us. I know it was a bit of a trek to come to the very end of the convention center, and it's towards the end of the conference, so I really appreciate you spending your morning with us today. My name is, um, there we go, Rachel Frick. I'm the executive director of the Research Library Partnership, and I'm going to be serving as your MC for the research update today. So just to give you a general overview about OCLC membership and research, we come together with a shared purpose to scale and accelerate library learning, innovation, and collaboration. So we do that with, I would like to say, three modes of activity. We have our core research work, which is devoted exclusively to the challenges facing our libraries, archives, and museums, and the communities that we serve. We support our elected delegates to the OCLC Regional and Global Councils, and it's a venue for local and regional views on issues facing libraries today. And then within the, our research division, we have two programs that really foster collaboration, conversations, and engagement with our research efforts, and that's the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which focuses on academic and research libraries, and Web Junction, which is the larger public library community. Like I said, these are our platforms to collaborate and connect. So just to give you a little bit more, um, I guess, context around Web Junction and the Research Library Partnership, I like to highlight these um, programs because not only is it the one that I run and Kendra's a part of, is that this is where the action has. This is where our research becomes actionable. This is where we have the conversations to move that innovation loop faster so that our research actually influences operational practice. We do that by activating our collaboration networks, we build and steward hands-on partnerships, and we create opportunities to pilot and, and get our hands dirty thinking about these complex issues. And we work together in a peer learning environment. So what does that mean? We really view that people are connections to knowledge, and this is a concept that was outlined in a, a recent book called The Power of Pool. Usually when you're trying to find information about something, usually your first mode is to contact somebody you know. So we try to pool that idea about our networks, and we create these opportunities to do that peer-to-peer -peer learning to connect across our network. And I know um, for the Research Library Partnership, we're a network of over 130 libraries around the globe, so that's a nice expanse and range of experiences that we can pull from. We do this and these conversations help us think about how we're going and where we're going and what information that we need to know and what skills we need to build on. It helps influence service design and future research efforts, not only within the OCLC organization, but across our whole community. We take the time to partner with allied organizations and other community groups, not just within the library community, but I would say allied partners in industry to really shape our future. And so the shared understanding, creating a common understanding and a common vocabulary, we believe allows for faster innovation. So how do we learn together? We do have in-person convenings, the more traditional way that I think everybody's familiar with. But what we've done in the past couple years is really move those in-person convenings because we know FaceTime is expensive and very is a luxury these days. So those meetings tend to be more action-oriented and focused on getting people together to have conversations as opposed to what we're doing today, which is the Sage on the Stage broadcasting. We do a lot of discussion and virtual working groups. We do do our traditional, what I say, surveys and then focus groups to help us dig into issues facing us. And then we are building a more robust program around technical prototypes and pilots that Karen will share with us a little bit later today. And then, of course, we have our webinars, which range from sharing stories across the network about excellence that our partners are doing to what I've been calling office hours, where we spin up um, uh, conversations about issues of the day. I mean, one of our most recent ones that was very robustly attended was around accessibility and digital exhibits. So with that, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about the collaborative effort, the community engagement. My colleagues, Karen Smith Yoshimura and Kendra Morgan, are going to talk about two important projects that you've probably heard a lot about while you were here at ALA Midwinter. One of them is about OCLC's linked data activity, and the other one is the public library response to the opioid crisis. But what these presentations are going to be a little bit different. They're going to be focused on the collaborative efforts, the community efforts, and how we see ourselves working um, at a scale that really moves all of us forward. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Karen. 
Yes, so collaborating with OCLC members on, on linked data. Um, this is a continuing story, and I'm gonna pick it up with the Entity JS project, an experiment that focused on techniques for discovery and navigation across descriptions of different entities, people, organizations, places, events, concepts, and creative works. The person entity lookup pilot conducted in 2014 explored with the OCLC member libraries listed here the features and user requirements of a shared reconciliation service for personal names. I think I'm just going to go. The content DM metadata refinery experiment tested workflows for analyzing, cleaning, reconciling, and transforming metadata from content DM collections in a shared web-based application. The results of the cleanup, analysis, and reconciliation could be transformed in the metadata refinery to RDF linked data so OCLC staff could explore how that data could be used to enhance discovery. Project Passage was a major pilot carried out by OCLC in 2017 and 2018, where we partnered with 16 libraries on a, part of, on a prototype to demonstrate the value of linked data for improving resource description workflows in libraries. I'll talk more about that collaboration with OCLC members in a bit. And this was followed by our Content DM linked data pilot launched last July, and more on that soon as well. This all culminated into the brand new exciting project on an entity management infrastructure, building on all that we've learned from all the previous projects. It's brand new, but I'll share some more details shortly. It's the last three projects that represent chapters of OCLC's continuing collaboration with OCLC members to operationalize linked data. So Project Passage um, had its objective was to evaluate a framework for reconciling, creating, and managing bibliographic and authority data as linked data entities and relationships. It built a community of users who could create and curate data in an ecosystem and imagine or propose future workflows. It provided a sandbox for hands-on experimentation. How do I create a linked data representation for the resources I'm looking at right now? How does this process compare with the method I may have already used to describe the resource? This was an open-ended exploration that led to patterns that we could build on in imagining a future of metadata in a linked data environment. So when we went from two partners in phase one of Project Passage to 15, we only expected about half that number would actually go through with it. But guess what? Everybody wanted in. So we had those 16. During weekly office hours, Project Passage partners showcased some of the use cases they were working on in describing resources and the related entities in the Wikibase structure. They highlighted the issues they encountered, which often led to additional features or properties. These are some of them. Translations, a digitized map, a poster for an event, a musical work associated with an event, a digitized postcard, a photo within an archival collection, and exploring the wiki-based multilingual capabilities for representing a personal entity. So these numbers only give a small indication of the intense engagement by our Project Passage participants. And I will also say that all of us learned so much in this project, and we had a lot of fun. <laughs> Metadata is fun, linked data even more fun. <laughs> That's the key takeaway, okay? Uh, <laughs> So some of the feedback that reflects some of the enthusiasm for this work, Project Passage was the very first linked data project that felt like it was, that it wholly encapsulated the values that we hold most, we as library catalogers and metadata folk hold dear. And Project Passage was the first postmark production environment that has the look and feel of what I do with my existing workflows. 
One direct result of the Project Passage experience was that we learned we needed to know more about the descriptive requirements of archives and special collections and what elements needed to be represented in linked data. We launched this review group comprised of 15 archivists and librarians from the OCLC Research Library Partnership just one month after our Project Passage report was published. I failed to mention earlier that that report was co-authored by 10 of the project pilot participants. We plan to share the results of these discussions in upcoming OCLC Research Library Partner webinars. So one key difference between the content DM link data pilot and Project Passage is that our goal is to do structured searching across all content DM repositories based on authority files and library staff defined vocabularies. The very successful office hours we held during the Project Passage pilot has been continued here. We hope we have already completed phase one um, which was to migrate all the content the metadata from our partners into a linked data platform, again using a separate Wikibase instance. As we go into phase two and three, we will be exploring new, developing new tools for managing the metadata, uh, batch loading of the metadata into Wikibase, and using Wikibase as a basis for end user discovery interfaces. So this work is done again in collaboration with five, now five partners listed here, and we are continuing those office hours and exploring what they need and developing new tools, such as an annotator um, for annotating digital, digital content. You can learn more about this project at the URL shown here. And if you are interested in getting involved in future phases, please contact well, this is hard. Please contact Content DM Manager Shane Huddleston. Yeah, it's a tongue twister. So what some of the early feedback we've received from our Content DM partners is that one of the things you're offering is a way to have fun. See, it's not just me. It's quite literally a window into new ways of thinking about what we do. So, just launched the Entity Management Infrastructure, but we did receive funding from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, $2.43 million grant that's being matched by OCLC to publish authoritative, accessible entity descriptions for persons and work, and to be jointly curated by both the community and OCLC. We plan to support multiple standards and encoding standards, and that includes AACR2, RDF, and of course, BibFrame. And we expect that these persistent identifiers we create to be accessible by URIs and APIs. So we just launched this, and it's going to be completed by December 2021, and with the goal to support linked data initiatives underway by both the library and scholarly, communications, scholarly communication communities. We are building on the work from all the collaborative projects I talked about earlier with the goal that the shared entity management infrastructure will be able to be used and interoperate with other tools developed for, for example, the LD4 community, we're forming an we're now forming an advisory group to help us to help inform our development plans and others. For example, the Program for Cooperative Cataloging and Big Heads, the directors of large research libraries, but also with international colleagues as well. So if I do some reflections, in all our efforts it's become clear that we will need a new mindset to transition from records to graphs a paradigm shift that takes us from the, the cutter's cult of the title page to one centered around entities and their relationships with other entities. Tasks that become obsolete include requiring one preferred form of name and relying on identifiers instead, and also the whole concept of language of cataloging. But the intellectual work to describe and provide the interpret the context and the 
what needs to be known about a resource, that intellectual work will remain the same. Yeah, sorry. We also expect that we will have to, there's, a, there's more opportunities for collaboration with the community at large through reinventing crowdsourcing. If not the whole crowd, at least expert subsets of that crowd. But that will put increasing pressure on our also describing and sharing the provenance of each of those statements for both where it comes from and its trustworthiness. So that is our way of trying to balance the quality of the metadata that we all pride ourselves in doing now with the wild Wikipedia context of where anybody can say anything about anything. And that will require us to have create new tools for managing that quality. So beyond the scope of these projects, we also devote time to learn from others, together with creating new knowledge and amplifying what we've learned. Among OCLC relationships with the Program for Cooperative Cataloging, our OCLC staff involved in multiple task groups, some of which are listed here. These task groups also inform OCLC about our own development, our own future developments and current developments. Several of my colleagues participate in the Linked Data for Production Affinity Groups. One is on the LD4 Conference Program Committee, and several of us participated in last year's conference in Boston. These events help us both to learn from others, as well as amplify what we've learned in our own activities. And most recently, OCLC hosted a weekly data working hour right here at AOA Midwinter last Friday for those interested in getting hands-on wiki data experience. I reported on the 2018 responses to the International Linked Data Survey for implementers that we saw a surge in libraries using wiki data as a linked data source from a rank of number 15 in 2015 to number 5 in 2018. We've included Wikidata as one of the sources in our virtual international authority file, shown here with the Wikidata logo. But we have a long, wide range of relationships and activities with the Wikimedia Foundation, which are described on our OCLC research webpage at the URL, URL shown here. One of those activities was holding an introduction to Wikidata for librarians held in 2018. And if you go to that URL, you can, the recording and the slides are still available at that URL. So, some takeaways. First, set an end date for any kind of project. I'll say that again. Send an end date, start and end, period. But you demand participation for however long that project's to last. Expect some resistance, especially for things that are really new. Communicate frequently and document everything. And accept the outcome. Not every idea is a winner, so fail fast and move on. And you should be disappointed if you wind up with something that looks exactly like you expected to build from the start. If it does, you've does it, you haven't learned much. And the plan for production should look different from your prototype. And if it does, look back at what your original vision statement was, your lean canvas, and see if they still hold true. But in all, the key takeaway really is collaboration. Community input will determine the path forward, as it has in our projects that I've described earlier. Much can be accomplished through partnership. And actually, together, we can make breakthroughs happen. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Kendra. So just real quickly with a show of hands, how many of you have had a conversation in the workplace about the impact of the opioid crisis, either on your campus, in your public library, in your community? A handful? Okay, good. 
Um, I'm going to have the opportunity today to talk a little bit about a program uh, that I've been working on for the past 15 months uh, called Public Libraries Respond to the Opioid Crisis with Their Communities. This project was started um, as a result of a September 2017 online town hall that was hosted by OCLC and our colleagues at the Public Library Association. And what we did was to bring together frontline library staff partner organizations, government entities, to talk about what was happening in public libraries around the opioid crisis. And what we heard from that presentation were that people wanted more information. Library staff wanted to know how they could help. They wanted to know what resources were available to them. And we both, OCLC and PLA, saw a true opportunity to bring our strengths and dig into some research that would help inform decisions. So we put together a proposal for the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and that research project was funded, and we are now 16 months through an 18-month project. And when it comes to collaboration, this really was a great opportunity for us to work with our colleagues at PLA and leverage the strength of both of our organizations and our reach into the library field. Because public libraries are buildings open to all, including those who may be in crisis and looking for safe space, library staff are finding themselves on the front lines of this crisis. Library responses to this issue have included providing information on prevention, treatment and recovery support, and training staff on the facts, as well as how to help use naloxone in the event of an emergency. These are all photos from libraries that participated in the project research. Um, I was very fortunate to get to go out and talk to the staff in many of these libraries, and I can tell you that their work was truly inspiring. I got to interview individuals who have been moved by the trouble that they are seeing in their community members and their communities, and they are looking for ways that they can respond. As we look at the bigger picture of how libraries are supporting community health challenges in general. This quote is from a report um, on the Healthy Library Initiative, which is a partnership between the University of Pennsylvania and the Free Library of Philadelphia. And the library here offers an amazing range of health-related programming to their community. And the report notes that there are two particular strengths that make library responses to any type of health issue really valuable, and that is the importance of accessibility and trustworthiness. Our doors are open and people trust us, and that is a tremendously powerful opportunity that we can take advantage of. This highlights the eight locations that participated in the case study research, and these communities ranged in size from 16,000 in population all the way up to 800,000 in Salt Lake County, Utah, and they represent a range of different responses. A really key part of this research for us was that we highlight that there is no one response, that each library, each community has to decide how to pursue the right response for their local needs. Um, there is a cluster of responses, uh, participants, because that area of the country has been hit particularly hard. Um, and we were able to work with these different libraries. A key part of the work, and we've talked about this importance of collaboration, every library that participated in this research was doing their response in collaboration, in partnership with a local community partner. Um, that was a really key part of this research because these community partners are bringing some amazing assets to their local library in terms of staffing, in terms of resources, and really helping to strengthen the response. Um, I, men I mentioned that one of the key things that was important for the research was the inclusion of uh, a partner. We did interviews with library staff, with their partner staff, with a library board member, and up to three members of the community who had participated in, in the library's services. So that was a really important aspect for us, is that we also got to talk to the patrons who are benefiting from the services. So there were four key aspects to the research. I just touched on the case studies. 
Um, a second piece of the work were cross-sector discussions. Again, in that spirit of collaboration, we wanted to go outside of the library field to better understand what resources already existed. This is a really challenging topic with some really difficult issues to face, and there are many experts in the field and people in the community who are working through so many aspects of this response that we're encouraging libraries to look to those partners as potential allies in helping to surface responses and information for individuals. We also have a call to action white paper that's coming out next month just in advance of the Public Library Association Conference in Nashville and then ongoing dissemination to the field. So we've done several webinars already. Um, they're all archived and available through webjunction.org, and you can find materials in the back of the room highlighting how to access those resources, as well as other resources highlighting the OCLC research work. We'll have another webinar in March, uh, and it really is a great opportunity to learn more specifically from the libraries that have participated in this research and some of the findings. We've really talked about the importance of collaboration and how organizations are coming together to meet needs. And a key thing for us was to have a steering committee for this project that was comprised of voices that were not just from the library field, but from outside as well. So we had the National Association of Counties represented, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, um, members of public libraries, both directors and frontline staff. Um, and the importance here was that we could both learn from each other because we want to encourage people from outside of the library field to really look at libraries as powerful partners. Um, we wanted to make sure we include their voices and that they helped us shape not just the interview protocol for this project, but the case studies and the resulting research and how we presented that and how we talked to people outside of the library field. So there are eight real buckets of uh, findings when it came to the types of programs and services that libraries offer. And there are a range of responses, and this was really important to us. One of the key things that we know very solidly is that no one response is going to fit every community. Whether there's a staffing concern, a budget restraint, attitudes and bias within the community that may make a response challenging, we wanted to make sure that we were highlighting a range that could meet the needs of many different communities. By far the most common response that we heard from, both as we were looking for participants in the research and talking to libraries, was providing some kind of training around naloxone. So naloxone is an opioid overdose reversal drug. You may have heard it referred to as Narcan, which is a brand name. If you are a public library, you can get two doses of Narcan from your, for your library for free. Um, we have links to that on our site. Um, those trainings are something that are happening both for staff and for the public. As part of our research, we focused on the public implementation of these training programs, um, but they are happening both behind the scenes for staff and for the patrons as well. There are also some really um, high-touch programs like offering peer navigators. In, at the Kalamazoo Public Library in Michigan, um, they have partnered with the Southwest Michigan Recovery Institute, and they have peer navigators coming to the library, and these peer navigators come with lived experience of their own. Sometimes this could be with substance use disorder in their past, sometimes with experiencing homelessness, and they're able to help connect individuals in the library with local community resources, which takes some of the challenge that library staff have reported feeling um, and give that as an option for peer navigators to address. What was fantastic about what happened in Kalamazoo is they knew they had the capacity to support about three hours a week. That's all they could start with, and that's where they started. And then they were able to show support and interest and gain the funding to grow that program to now be able to offer 40 hours a week. But they saw the need and they did something. There's also a great program at the Blount County Public Library in Tennessee, and they are partnering with the local recovery court to offer life skills trainings to individuals who are going through the recovery court process. So these are individuals who have received a sentence and some jail time for a drug offense in the community. 
the library is providing skills on technology, on employment, on healthy eating, and they, the participants come to the library every week to receive this training. And that partnership grew out of a lunch or a coffee between the director and a member of the recovery court staff where the library director asked, how can we help you? And it all spun out of a simple coffee. And it is one of the most powerful partnerships I've heard from. Uh, the individuals who are participating in that program have so much appreciation for what the library staff are doing. This is an example of an opioid uh, overdose rescue kit at the Peoria Public Library. In it, they have two doses of Narcan, instructions on what to do next, because that's a critical part of administering naloxone, is immediately calling EMS for additional support. Um, and the staff has received training on this, but people have approached this in different ways. So the New Orleans Public Library is doing a fantastic job in partnership with their health department around offering bystander response training. And that combines a training that includes CPR, stop the bleed, which is for traumatic injuries, and administering naloxone. And what I really like about that program is that it takes a lot of the stigma away from carrying and using naloxone in the event of an emergency. It also provides people the opportunity to learn more about the realities of addictions in our communities and drug dependency. This is a quote that uh, one of the community members that I interviewed in New Orleans um, said during our research. And they said that the program benefits them because they feel more prepared to help someone. And I think any time you feel more prepared and trained, you're much more likely to help. And this goes to the core of what I would consider lifelong learning in the library, that we're empowering people to do more in their lives. And if that includes helping someone by providing them access to information and skills, that feels remarkably powerful. This is a campaign at the Salt Lake County Library System in Utah, and it's a statewide campaign called Use Only as Directed that was funded through the Health Department. And this is a wraparound on the checkout desk of the public library, and it's information that lets individuals know that opioids can cause physical dependency in as few as seven days, and that they can talk to their doctors about alternatives. They are making this part of their conversation in the community. They also have this really impactful display when you walk into the library. There's a large vestibule, and hanging from the ceiling are 7,000 paper pill bottles that represent the 7,000 prescriptions for opioids that are filled in Utah every day. Every day. It is a real challenge in their community, and they are trying to reduce the prescribing rate, and they are trying to reduce the overdose rate. So of course when we do research, we're always interested in the outputs that are reported in our communities. The number one thing that both the library staff and the members of the pub or the partnerships mentioned was that there were more community resources available. Um, things like naloxone, additional books on topics that might be of interest to people on who are trying to learn more about opioids. Um, there's a positive impact on patrons' lives. One of the things that we heard pretty frequently was measuring some of the um, change is really difficult because of the unique privacy aspect. Libraries are already sensitive about uh, patron privacy, and then you layer medical concerns on top of that, and it can be a really difficult thing. Uh, we heard at least one individual tell us that even writing down the name of someone that they're talking to specifically around addiction issues can cause some concerns concerns with trust. And so their number one concern, and this is what we heard from partners and from the library staff, is that they just want to provide people with the access to information that they need. So a third bucket of the project work were cross-sector discussions. And I will say going into this work, um, it was a little daunting to me to speak to people outside the library field um, as much as this was going to require us to. Um, I love touting the value of libraries and shining a light and amplifying all the amazing work that's happening. But I wasn't sure how this was going to go. And it went fantastically. Um, we were able to bring together 
uh, 40 different organizations in four online convenings. And the whole point of those convenings was to make sure that those people knew that this work was happening in libraries, that libraries might be partners that their organizations could work with. And we wanted to listen to what they had available. So as we um, had the chance to have these discussions and people were sharing their resources, we've pulled those together and been able to create repositories of information, access to websites, 1-800 numbers that provide support um, that were shared by these individuals. A great resource that some of you may be available um, or aware of is from the National Council of Behavioral Health, which provides access to mental health first aid training, which includes a component on opioids, but it's also about how to address mental health within your community, either as a professional um, in any type of workplace or as a private citizen. Um, and we were able to learn more about that program and about libraries that have been implementing that. Um, the State Library of Ohio uh, provided training across the state through IMLS subgrants last year, uh, and state uh, individual libraries could apply for and provide mental health first aid training. But we also learned about a lot of alignment. So the National Recreation and Park Association has a lot in common with public libraries. We have a lot of the same discussions about the needs in our community and how we're trying to, to meet those needs. So that was a fantastic way to, to really see about making intentional connections. Our next major output comes out next month, and that's our call to action report. And we are going to look at five major aspects of uh, the research, and that are those are uh, exploring your community data, considering community assets and connecting with partners, increasing awareness and knowledge of the issue among staff in the community, a focus on library staff care. It's really important to acknowledge that library staff can feel the stress and the pressure from having to respond to these issues in their community. People are filled with a lot of compassion. Um, the individuals that they are working with are sometimes addressing some very challenging issues in their life. Um, I did not anticipate being as impacted by this work as I was, but I truly sat through some of these interviews and cried with these individuals about the work that they were doing and about how the library was doing everything that they could to respond to what they saw as a strong need in their community. And we want to make sure that we take the time to acknowledge that there are ways to help support staff and to be clear in our communications and the resources that we provide that there are needs there. And then the last bucket is around offering community engagement and programming options. One of the community member partner staff um, shared with me that they hope that this study that we've done is just another piece of proof that this is something that we need to do. Our communities are hurting. People are finding this very challenging. And there is much that we can do in response and every community needs to look at it a little bit differently. And we hope that the research and the outputs that OCLC and PLA have put together can help people to navigate that change. Thank you. I'm always impressed by the passion of my colleagues, and, it, and especially people that take things that are very complicated and make them very accessible. And I don't know about you, I can always feel Karen's excitement about metadata. And then I'm also, my second thought is, I'm so glad it's you. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of amazing people out there working on these issues and it's not just our OCLC colleagues but connecting with our communities in our network and pulling out that those amazing passionate people to come together and work on these ideas together because that's how we're going to move things forward right we do have a lot of handouts I see my fellow OCLC colleague Dennis Massey in the back doing a nice fan of white for me, thank you, um, of handouts on the back table. One of them is our research update for this quarter as well as a couple handouts specifically about some of our um, uh, programming. So please feel free to help yourself with paper to weigh down your baggage on your way home. If not, a lot of those things are available online and I'll give you some URLs in the end. Just some upcoming highlights. We are having our second OCLC Research Library Partnerships Research Retreat. It is hosted by the Research Library Partnership, but it's open to everybody. 
Um, we realize once again that having time together is a luxury. So we're having, I was talking to a friend of mine, I said, wouldn't you want to have a day to hang out with some really smart people and talk about things? And then we just let the conversation roll where it needs to go. Or maybe you have a big problem that you want to bring to your colleagues to spend some time figuring out. And I remember both of my friends were like, Yes, please. And that is exactly what the research retreat is. We bring in two highlight, I would say, thought provoker people to get your brain moving a little bit. And this year it's going to be Monica McCormick, who is an AUL at the University of Delaware, is going to be kicking things off in the evening of the 21st. And then we'll have a full day of interactive problem solving on April 22nd in Dublin, Ohio. So you get the added benefit if you've never come to the OCLC campus to come and see the amazing facility that is OCLC, but also have an opportunity to interact with the larger OCLC staff. For you, those of you who don't know about the Research Library Partnership Works in Progress webinars, this is a benefit for people who um, contribute along to the Research Library Partnership, but they're also, after they're recorded, are available to anyone for free on our website. Three that are upcoming are listed here. I'm not going to read them out to you, but you can see that we're having lots of conversation around research information management and research data management, thinking about privacy and sensitive materials, but also um, the, also around discovery and how students use our resources, which is the last one about um, how students identify resources in face of container collapse, which is a phrase that our colleague Dr. Lynn Silipini conaway has coined in her research about library and the life of the user. This is a program I wanted to highlight. It's gotten a lot of good buzz, and we're really excited about it. And I think, um, in my mind, <coughs> Even though Web Junction partners with our public library community, there's a lot of lessons here that I think cross our library community. So there's definitely takeaways for us in the academic and research library world. But here's some training coming up about access to legal justice training and talk about partners are working with the Legal Services Corporation to improve access to legal, civil legal justice through public libraries. So this is a free national training for public library staff but maybe you could lurk if you're not a public library staff person to help strengthen that access and um, understand the barriers and um, work through that. And I think February 11th is an introductory webinar and it is a free five week course. So there's the URL, really simple, oc.lc slash legal dash justice. We like user studies and we do a lot of user study research. And this one is about how students judge online scientific news information, I think very, um, important in the day, so you can see this um, white paper, not white paper, article in the issues in science and technology librarianship that came out in 2019. And this is our most recent position paper on data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence in libraries. This was published at the end of December when everybody was probably feeling overwhelmed by the end of the year, so if you didn't catch it, don't worry about it. This was um, created by our practitioner researcher in residence, Thomas Padilla, who spent, um, I guess, about 18 months with us at OCLC, helping us really explore these issues and then also help advise OCLC about how we can provide um, more space and help build community around our own data science practice. So if you haven't had a chance to read this paper, it is very enlightening thinking about um, uh, what I appreciated about Thomas's perspective is that instead of really going into the technology itself, he's really looking at the ethical issues in this area. So kind of a humanistic uh, approach to this very interesting and emerging area in libraries. You might have heard about our collective collection case study around BTAA. This has really influenced their future direction on how they share print resources. It was authored by Lorcan Dempsey, Constance Smalpus, and Mark Sandler. It's available at this URL. And coming soon, we had a really great survey sponsored by the OCLC Global Council um, a year and a half ago. And it's about open content. And those survey results are actually going to be published on March 9th. And I'm going to leave you with this. Yes, we do meet a lot virtually, but a number of us are actually going to be in the physical plane on these specific conferences from the Ontario Library Association Super Conference, which is happening towards the end of this week, Pilapalooza for our friends that might be participating online from um, uh, Europe. That's actually going to be in Lisbon. The link 
the f I can't believe it's the fifth one, Laudlam. Uh, linked open data for libraries, archives, and museums. That's going to be taking place at the Getty, right, in the California. Um, the IDCC uh, Council, uh, you can, I'm not going to read these all to you, but this is where we're going to be. And as Kendra said, I think the PLA Association Conference in Nashville is going where if you want to hear more and more details about our um, uh, report around libraries' response to the opioid crisis. All right, with that, thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>